evening, church. How's everyone doing? Man, it's so nice, man. It was a good, I woke up, I was like, oh, it's so nice. And I was only up for a couple of minutes. And my allergies started going nuts, like just angry at me. And so, and you know, it's funny because we're still talking about healing tonight. And so I'm walking through it. I'm walking and believing. And so if you're struggling with allergies, no, I'm with you. And I'm praying for you and I'm believing for you. And, you know, you get those times where you're just like, if I could just reach into my nostrils and remove my nose, I think I would feel better. You know, but you know what? Praise God. He's good. And I'm doing much better this afternoon than I was this morning for sure. So we are in our series. This is how I see you. And this last weekend we talked about healed. And we talked about healing and what it is to, to be healed. And that God wants to heal every part of you. And that we get to have faith and believe in him. And we get to walk that out. And we get to see that. And we get to believe that he's working on our behalf. Even when we maybe are not seeing what we think we should see. Uh, and I wanted to kind of, kind of continue that, that theme a little bit. And I wanted to talk about a story that I think encapsulates that pretty well. Uh, because a lot of times... God has the audacity to do something in a way that we think he should not do it. Sometimes he has the audacity to do something that we didn't ask him to do. Sometimes he has a way of doing things that's better than we would know. Or it's in a better timing than we would know. But that's hard because we're humans and the truth is we just want it the way we want it. Right? Like, hey, God, good morning. I would like to tell you what you need to do for me today. I have it all planned out. It's very simple. Just You just need to follow these steps and my life will be great. Thank you very much. Which is the reality of what we do to God in prayer a lot. Right? And this is not a, a condemning thing. This is, I'll just put it myself in this thing. You just kind of go through and like, God, I need you to fix this. I need you to fix that. Go ahead and I need you to become you know, extremely wealthy and you need to heal all my things and my house needs to take care of itself. My lawn needs to mow itself. I need you to figure out all these things and then in Jesus' name, amen. Right? And, you know, God is good and kind and loving and patient uh, and therefore he hasn't like smited me dead yet because he, he cares about me and that's not how, who he is anymore. But we, we sometimes have this idea of what we think needs to happen and we've played it out in our minds and then maybe something happens differently. Maybe God asks us to do something differently. Maybe he approaches it from a different way than we would have ever expected. And sometimes our response is, is, is not the best response. Sometimes my response is not the best. It's like, no, 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 God, I think you're confused. That wasn't what I asked you to do. I didn't ask for, for that. I, I, I didn't ask for you to do, to do that. Or, and I definitely didn't ask for you to give me something to do. That wasn't why I asked you to do something. I, I don't ask you to do something so I get more to do. You know, I tell that to my kids all the time. I didn't ask you to clean up your room so that then therefore I somehow have more work to do as a result of you cleaning your own room, which somehow happens. Kids can do that. You can give them a job and somehow you give yourself more work. I, I don't know how it happens, but it happens. And so we don't, we don't like that, but there's a story uh, in Second Kings that I think really uh, kind of shows this story. And then we're going to look at some of the healing miracles of Jesus but uh, re regarding healing. And it's Second Kings chapter 5, and I'm going to pick a few verses uh, to kind of look at it. So in verse 1, uh, it says, The king of Aram had a great admiration for Nahum, or Naaman. Some people say Naaman, some people say Nahum, some people say Nahum. I bet they're all wrong. I bet no one called him that at all. But we're going to go with Naaman because I think it's the most common one. So Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But through, but through, though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. So let's put all this in a little bit of context. This is 2 Kings. This is the time where Elisha is the prophet slash judge of Israel, okay? You know, Elisha, he took over from Elijah. When I was young, I was really, that was one of my beefs with God. Like, why would you give him names so close? I kept missing the questions. Who did whatever? Elisha, no, it was Elijah. I'm like, no, I was so close. I knew which one it was, but they're too close. 
And then you know when like there's two names that are close, you try to like mash them together. Like you know, I okay. Did it, uh, and you're like, nope, that was not an answer. Uh, this is going back to Bible Bowl days when I just kept missing all the questions. Uh, three people are like, yeah, Bible Bowl. Um, but so he's he's kind of ruling Israel, and Israel, as per usual, have been in these ups and down seasons of their faithfulness to God. And throughout this time, you know, when God would be punishing them, he would use other nations to punish Israel, whether it be through raids, whether it be through oppression, whether it be and through sometimes complete uh, takeover. Uh, but Aram, and the, the, the nation of Aram was a, a country that was constantly invading Israel. Uh, we talked about Gideon a few weeks ago. That was another group of people. But this is, this is a group. They're coming in. They're stealing stuff. They're raiding. They're taking prisoners. They're, they're doing all this kind of stuff. And they were constantly coming in and causing problems and, and warring with the nation of Israel. And Naaman was a general for that kingdom. And it's interesting. You can see it because it says that the Lord graded Naaman victories. He wasn't even a Jew. But God was using him. God was using him because he had issues with Israel. And so this guy was a great man, had many great victories, had won a lot of stuff, but he had a skin condition. Now, obviously, it wasn't the extremely severe version of leprosy because leprosy has different degrees. There's some where you become completely debilitated uh, and you are losing appendages and, and the like, and there's a lot of different issues. So he, you can have a little more moderate version, but you, you still don't want moderate leprosy, just in case you were wondering. Like, moderate leprosy is still not like, oh, I take that. No, you don't want it. You know, when you're a teenager, you don't want a pimple. A pimple is as bad as like a hundred pimples. They're all, it's just one is just as bad as a thousand, right? So it's the same thing. In fact, the clearer your face is, the more blemished it looks with just one. You know what I'm saying? Like, see, I had real bad acne, so it was like one, 12, 15, who cares? It's all just a mess up there. Uh, you know, but like I had to have friends like, I got a pimple. I was like, okay, congratulations, your weekend's ruined. Mine's fine. I've had like thousands. Uh, it can't, can't change me, right? So he has a slight version of leprosy, more moderate, because he can still function. He can still fight. He can still, uh, he can still there. Obviously, their culture isn't the same as the Jewish culture, because the Jewish culture takes lepers and excludes them, right? They're completely removed. They have to be separate. They have to stay away from people. They can have no physical contact. Obviously, Aram does not do those same things because he's clearly functioning and has troops and all this kind of stuff. So he suffered from leprosy. And basically what happens, he had a servant girl that was actually a captive from Israel. And it became his wife's servant. And she told his wife if he could only go and see the prophet from Israel, Elisha, if he could only go see him, I know that he could heal him. I knew that he could be healed. So the wife tells Naaman, and Naaman ends up, ends up going to the king and saying, King, there's this prophet in Israel, and he can do miracles, and I want to go to see if he can heal my leprosy. And so the king says, yeah, no problem. No problem. You go. I'm even going to send a letter. You take your people. I'll send a letter with you to the other king, you know, because king to king business kind of a thing. And you're going to get, you, you can take care of this. You can go do it. So he says, great. So in verse 6, Naaman shows up to the king and he delivers this letter. And it says, the letter the king of Is to, to the king of Israel said, this is verse, verse 6, it says, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of leprosy. That's all it said. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy. It's a letter that says, hi, king, you're a friendly king. That's not actually a friendly king because I keep stealing your stuff and killing your people and stealing them. This is my guy. You've probably seen him on the battlefield. He's killed lots of your people, stolen lots of your women, and pl plundered your crops. I need you to heal him of an incurable disease. Thanks. End of transmission. When the king of Israel read the letter... It says, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, am I God that I give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. He thinks he's on like the ancient version of punked. 
like some scribe was hiding around the corner writing down responses, right? That he was going to send back, like, he's punking me now. This is, there's a hidden scribe somewhere just waiting to get me. Gotcha journalism. Like, no way, no way this guy's asking me to heal. First of all, why would he even ask me? And let alone, what, what am I supposed to do? I'm not God. I'm just a king. If, he, if kings could do it, then his king should do it. I can't heal people with incurable diseases. And he's upset. Like, this guy keeps stealing his stuff. They keep fighting all the time. And he's like, I, I can't believe this guy. I can't believe that this guy would come. And so he, he was not happy. And, and you'll see later, this king wasn't a great king, and he wasn't all in his, his, he tore his clothes a lot. It didn't take a lot for him to get into weeping. Let's just put it that way. Times when he probably should have torn his clothes, he was fine. Other times, he just was constantly like, no. Like, he was a little dramatic. Uh, so he's upset. But I love verse 8. And, and, and I don't know, you know, the Bible doesn't give us, it gives us details, doesn't give us all the details. But somehow, Elisha heard about this. I, again, I don't know how, because they're not in the same area. Um, but maybe a messenger, maybe a carrier pigeon, I don't know how he heard about it. But he found out what it said. And in verse 8, it says, but when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay. He sent this message to him, and this is just a boss message. Elijah's just kind of, he's, I like him. He said, why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. You're going to learn today. That's what he told me. He said, today, you're going to learn something. You may, you may be nervous about it, but today, you're going to learn something. I come, tell him to come over to my house. He, I will show him something about God and a prophet, Right? Which is confusing because this is who he was going to in the first place. This is who he thought he needed to go to. This is who the girl said he needed to go to, right? But that's not where he went first. You, you know, and this kind of points something, just kind of a little side trip. Sometimes we know we need to go to God first, but we go somewhere else first because it makes more sense. Because they've got credentials behind their name. Because they went to school for eight years. Right? Which is kind of funny. Eight years. Maybe they've been practicing for eight years. God's eternal. But we do it anyways. I've done it. But we go where we think we need to go because it makes more sense. Because it, was, it would have been rude to go to the prophet without going to the king. So we go to the king, even though the king has no ability. So he doesn't go where he needs to go. He doesn't even know what we want to do. And we do this sometimes. We know we need to go to God first and then find out what we want to do. But sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we go to our own idea first. Or we go to what uh, decorum says we should do or what the standard procedure is. And that's not going to work very well. So, he goes to Elijah. And he has been playing this, this scenario, Naaman that is, has been playing this scenario in his mind because when he left, he brought all sorts of stuff. It says he brought over 700 pounds of silver and over 150 pounds of gold. That's a lot. And then a whole bunch of really nice clothes, too. And all these other things. And he brought that because that was going to be his gift to the prophet. I don't know how much in today's money. I mean, I guess I could have calculated it and done. I haven't done, but that's a lot of money. You thought your last doctor's visit cost a lot. I mean, this guy, this was serious. And so he shows up, and so he believes. And Naaman's a man of honor. He's honored where he's at. He's a general. He is honored, and he believes that he's going to come to this place. That he's going to be greeted by this prophet. But something happens. Before he gets there, or as he's kind of arriving to the home of Elijah, Elisha sends a servant and says, my master told me to tell you that all you need to do to be healed is go to the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times, and you'll be cleansed. You'll be healed. No big deal. So, see you later. And he was upset. He was, he was angry. 
he was angry about the fact that Elisha didn't even come and see him. I came all this way. You know, it's like when you go to your doctor's appointment and you only see the PA. Like, I waited the whole time to see the doctor. Oh, he's actually in Cancun today. Oh, no. Like, I just am having knee recovery. I only saw my doctor once. It was just crazy. He was never there. Uh, I just can't forgive him. But in verse 11, he says something interesting. He said, but Naaman became angry and stalked away. And this is what he said. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God to heal me. Aren't the rivers in Damascus, the Abana, and the Farpar better than any of the rivers in Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned away and went away in rage. He didn't do it how I wanted him to do it. He didn't do it how I imagined it happening. He didn't come out and make a big deal about me. He didn't give me the respect that I deserve. He didn't come out and wave his hands over me. It didn't happen how I thought it should happen. So I'm just going to leave. So I'm going to leave. Because I had an expectation and it didn't get met. You know, I know there's been times that I've prayed and I was like, God, I need to, this, this healing in my life, whether it's physical, mental, spiritual. And instead of healing the symptom, God gives me something that he wants to work on that's the root. And I don't want to work on the root. I want help with the symptom. But he doesn't want to do it how I want to do it. And so sometimes I say, ah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. That wasn't how I imagined it. I didn't imagine this conversation going that way. When I, when I wanted this particular thing happen, why did you talk to me about lifestyle choices? Why did you talk to me about uh, my diet whenever I wanted you to fix something else? I don't want to change my diet. I like how I eat. Bad. Bad is good. I don't want to change that. Don't, don't make me change anything. I need you to wave your hands over me and fix it. God, do you not understand? I don't need to do anything. Don't ask me to do anything. You do it. Wave. You know, it happens all the time. And, you know, we have these issues where, you know, we, we have a, a, a blood pressure issue, and we say, God, I want you to heal my blood pressure. And he says, hey, I want to I heal the anger that's inside you. It's like, no, 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 I don't want to deal with that. Just heal the blood pressure. Well, what do you think is causing that? God, I'm having this symptom in my life. And then he, he wants to walk you through a different root cause of that. And it's like, I don't want to deal with that. I don't, no, 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 I don't want to deal with that. That's not how I imagined it. When I imagined it, it was something different. I imagined it differently. And it's not that he wants you to do the work. It's that he wants to work on the source. He wants to work on the root. He wants to work in your heart. Sometimes we, we pray for other things that we think is the issue. I just wish my spouse would be better. Jesus, heal my spouse because something's wrong with that. They're always nagging me. Can you heal them of that? Wave your hand over my spouse so they will no longer nag. And then my life will be better. And he says, I need you to work on you so you can be a better husband or a better wife. I'm like, no, 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 no. I wasn't here for me. They nagged me. I need you to fix it. Can you, can you fix in them? My boss is always annoying me and riding on me. They're mean and they don't treat me right. 
I need you to fix that. And he says, well, how about we work on your attitude and your heart and your unconditional love? I don't like that. I don't like that, God. I'm leaving. We'll do something else. I'll deal with it. I'll just, I'll just deal with it. I mean, he says, I'd rather have leprosy than do this. I'd rather have leprosy than do this. And he was, notice, he didn't want the money. He was going to give him millions of dollars. But for free, no, that's not good enough. I don't want it free. But there's an interesting turn. His servants basically stop him and say, listen, come on, man, calm down. And thank God for good friends. Sometimes you need a good friend to encourage you to do what God's asking you to do and to relook at a situation. Because they, they come to him and they say, hey, listen, Captain, my Captain, if he had told you to do something really crazy, if he had told you to give him all the money and go on some epic adventure and to do some incredible challenge, wouldn't you have done it? He's like, of course I would. I'm a maniac. I'd have done anything. But it's like, well, then why won't you just do the easy thing? Why won't you do what he's asking you to do? It's not hard. It's not revolutionary. Why won't you just trust that he's giving you the, the, the thing that will get you better? Why is your pride getting in your way? Why are you not just doing what's asked of you as opposed, why are you being offended that he can come and meet you? Why, why don't you just do what he asked you to do? So he ends up saying, okay. So he goes to the Jordan. And how many people are happy that God's uh, offer are not one-time, limited-time offers. Because God could have said, Elijah could have said, nope, once you turn your back on this deal, it's over. Don't turn your back on my deal. Because he didn't go back and say, hey, does that offer still stand? Can I still go seven times? Has it increased because of my lack of faith? Is it 14 now? So he goes and he dips himself seven times and he comes out healed. And he's so excited. So he goes back to Elisha, and he wants to give him all the gifts. And Elisha says, nope, I don't want any of that. Just take it back. Go on. And so he makes these promises that he's only going to worship God, except for when he has to go to the temple with his king, and his king pulls him down to bow, and he's like, is that okay? My boss makes me worship false gods. But you know, sometimes we say, God, tell me to do something, anything, and I'll do it. But then when he tells us, it's like, no, no, not, not that. I meant something uh, better. I meant something harder. I meant something uh, more epic. I meant like you wanted me to go serve some people, you know, the poorest of the poor for six years. I would have done that. But you just want me to stay in this job and like love my boss unconditionally, even when they're rude to me? No, no, I'm not doing that. No, 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 no. Can't do that. You want me to pray for my wife every day? You, you want me to exercise? Well, how could you? I thought we were cool. Change my, change my diet, change my life. No, no, no. Tell me, send me somewhere far away and I'll do it. I'll do that. I'll, I'll go live in Africa for 10 years if that's what you want. But I will not give up my midnight bowl of ice cream. We've become together. And I can't separate it. And these are like silly things, but, you know, God doesn't do things the same way every time. A lot of times God's done something for us. Maybe he did a miracle for you. Maybe he healed something inside of you. Maybe he fixed something. And so therefore he did it one way. And so you think he did it this way the one time. And now I want him to do it again just like that. Can you do it just like that again? 
Remember that time when I was sick and, you, uh, and people prayed for me and I was healed? I need that. I want that one again. Do that one again. I, I have like a number one with cheese, please. That one, exactly the same. But God doesn't, that, he, he's not an ordering machine. He, just because he did something once doesn't mean he's going to do it just like that. The thing that he promises he'll do again is he'll be faithful. The thing that he says he'll do again is that he'll leave, never leave you or forsake you. The thing that he says he'll do again is that he loves you unconditionally and he has what's best for you. The end result he'll do again. The process won't be the same. And there's a good chance you may not like the process. Or it may not be the way you thought it should happen. He may not come and wave his hands over you the way you think you should. It may not be the glorious ordeal that you think you deserve. But you know what? It'll probably be exactly what you need if you just give him time. You know, for a second, for the end, we only have a couple minutes. A couple minutes. Time. That DC talk song. Time keeps ticking away. Tick, tick, ticking away. Tick, ticking. New thing? Anyone? DC talk new thing? Anyone have that cassette? You know what I'm talking about. I see you. Okay, I see you now. Okay. New thing in you. T H A N G. You know, yeah. Who's doing it? God, who's doing it? No. Now we can't post this thing because it's going to be copyright infringed. Sorry, DC Talk. So, I'm sorry. I'm just messing everything. It's, you know. Jesus healed a lot of people, a lot of diseases. But there's five times, five different times that he healed a blind person. Now, a couple of them also had other issues, like demon-possessed and blind, or demon-possessed, mute, and blind. So some of them were comboed, but they were all but five times blindness, can't see. And if you look in your, the Bible app, or you look at, I don't know if I'm going to have to read them all, the, there's, there's different times. Mark 7, 33, Mark 8, 23, John 9, 5 through 7, Mark 10, 49, and Matthew 12, 22. And what's interesting about this is five times, five separate occasions, and by the way, this is not the only blind people Jesus healed. Jesus healed so many people, we don't even have, like, the events that are recorded in Jesus' ministry is not everything. It's not even close. He was there for three years, and you get, like, an hour worth of reading. He did so much. Like, you can't imagine how much. You know, one of the, one of the in the Acts, they talk about how we recorded what we, thought, what, we could, what we could record, but no book could contain the ministry of Jesus. It couldn't be contained. But five times we record him healing a blind person. And five times, it's different. The end result's the same. They started blind, and they ended up seeing. But it was different. It, it, some of them were similar. Uh, in, in Mark 7, this one was blind and deaf. And he took them away from the crowd so they could be alone. And this is, you know, sometimes Jesus did some things. You're like, why did he do that? Uh, is that he put his fingers in the man's ears then spit on his own finger, and he touched the man's tongue. And then later is the one where he took him separate in Mark 8, and he spit on the guy's eyes. Then he put his hands on him, and he said, hey, can you see anything now? And, he, and, and this one's interesting because he says, yeah, I can see, but everything's blurry. And then he prayed again, and all of a sudden he could see perfectly clear, two times. But then in John 9, he told this guy, this sounds more like with Elijah, he says, hey, go to this pool and wash yourself and you'll be able to see. He's blind. How does he get there? Yeah, real funny. Real funny, Jesus. Hey, walk over to this place. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, I've heard of it. I've never seen it. 
Can someone uh, help 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 guy out? Can someone take me? Can someone take me to that place? I don't know how to get there. Like that's just like it sounds mean. Jesus told a blind guy, "Hey, walk over there and 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 dip yourself, and you'll be fine." It's like, oh yeah, easy. Can you just point me in the general direction? But he got there, and then he got healed instantly. But Jesus wasn't even there. Jesus was gone. Mark 10, they actually give the the, the guy a name. It's Bartimaeus. And you know what's sad? Bartimaeus gets healed. But in Sunday school, we learn about him as blind Bartimaeus. Good old blind Bartimaeus. Like, he's not blind. Isn't it amazing how we keep seeing people in their past and we give them a title based on their past, not based on what Jesus made them to be? Oh, blind Bartimaeus. Like, Bartimaeus is like, he's in heaven. Like, I'm not blind. (laughs) Why can't you call me seeing Bartimaeus? 2020. He asked him, hey, what do you want me to do for you? Because this is one where Jesus was going, he kept saying, son of David, have mercy, son of David, have mercy. And people around him were like, hey, shut it, blind guy. He doesn't care. He doesn't have time for you. He didn't need to talk to you. Just leave him alone. And Jesus heard him and said, bring, bring him to me. And then this is by this point, it's more towards the end of Jesus' ministry. And the disciples have real attitude problems. Like the disciples think they are like, they are the, like they are the entourage of entourage. Like they think they are so cool. And so they're literally like, hey, cheer up, man. The boss wants to see you. <laughs> like real smug. <laughs> Jesus was so patient. You know, I actually, I actually taught a sermon about this a few months ago because as soon as they said, hey, he's calling you, it said that Barmaeus threw aside his cloak. You guys remember that? Drop the cloak. You remember I talked about that? If you weren't here, the cloak was basically his government marker that said, this is a legitimate beggar. And as soon as he heard that Jesus was willing to talk to him, he threw away his old identity to walk to Christ to find his new identity. And he gets there, and Jesus says, what do you want? And again, Jesus sometimes, he, he, I think he's funny. Because what do you think he's going to ask for? Gee, he's blind. But he's not going to ask for a new camel. Like, well, I don't know, uh, since I have you here, maybe my sight would be great, Jesus. But Jesus wants you to ask. He wants you to ask. The, whole, the verse, you have not because you ask not, that's not some crazy like, oh, I want a quadrillion dollars. No, this, he wants you to invite him in to do something in your life. Ask him. And he says, go, your faith made you healed. Because he said, I want to see. All right, it's done, instantaneously. Why he didn't need to spit in his eyes or make mud in his eyes or poke him in the ear, I don't know, I don't know why. It's not the same. And in Matthew 12, there was a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak. He was brought to Jesus, and he healed the man. And the crowd was amazed. No friend group, no conversation. Just done. The healing and the healing process that God wants to do to you is great. It's the identity of who you have, who you are. God sees you as it. Sometimes it's going to be instantaneous. I've experienced instantaneous miracles in my life. And sometimes it's a process. Sometimes that process is years. Sometimes emotional and spiritual healing can take years for God to walk everything in you and to walk everything through you and for him to heal all the things that are inside of you. Sometimes it can take years. Sometimes it's weird. Sometimes God will ask you to do weird stuff. He'll put you in a place that seems weird. But when you're desperate, you'll do anything. When you're blind, you don't care if he's spitting in your eyes. If I get to see at the end, I'll do it. It can be unique. It's different. But sometimes we say, God, I want you to do it my way or the highway. 
Or maybe it's, God, I want you to do it the, the way you did it the last time. And what God's saying to us is, listen, the result's going to be the same. But how I do it may not be. And maybe I want to work on you in a few more ways. Maybe there's areas in your life I want to keep improving. Maybe I want to get to the root of an issue as opposed to the fruit that you're dealing with. Because there's something deeper that we can heal. There's something inside of you that I want to pull out because I have the best for you. I want your best life now. And I shared this weekend about my knee and the healing journey for my knee and the process. And, you know, I, I just was thanking God because I don't know what would have happened if he just miraculously healed me. But in this process, the things that I received the trust that I've built in him, the things that he's spoken to my life, the identity that he's given to me, the words that he's put inside my head, the encouragement, the overwhelming love that I've experienced in the season. If, if, if that's what happens when I don't get what I want, then you know what? Just keep not giving me what I want. Just keep doing what you want in my life. Just keep working inside of me. Not my will, but your will be done. Because it's going to be better. It's going to be better than what I thought. God's doing something. You know, and we'll, we'll share more about it. There were miracles that happened this last weekend. It was a big weekend for our church. People came down and made a statement of their identity of who they were in Christ. There were supernatural, instantaneous miracles that happened that we're going to keep getting together and we're going to be able to share with you. But you know, the physical miracles are incredible. But there were mental miracles that were, there were emotional, there were identity miracles that happened down here. And even in the chairs, you know, one of the coolest miracles I had, he was like, I was too scared to go down. And God healed me right where I was at. Because it doesn't matter going down. It's a matter of, do you see Jesus? Do you see him? God's in a process. We're all in a process. We're all in a journey. God wants to work something inside of you. He's working on something. He's working on you. He's working in you. He's working through you. He is working. And sometimes, for me, I just get in his way. I realize that I am just like him. What my kids do to me, I'm just getting in the way, blocking stuff. Oh, let me help you do this. God, I got a better way. Oh, no, did I totally ruin it? I'm sorry. My bad. You didn't want to do it? Oh, I go in as better. But he's working on you. He loves you. It may not be, you may be like Naaman. It may not be the way you thought you deserved or the way you thought it was going to happen. It may not be the way it's happened before. But it doesn't change what's happening. It doesn't change the process. It doesn't change your identity. It doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change God's heart for you. He wants you to live in the identity of being healed. He wants you to live with the truth that he's working on a process. And what we get to do as believers, as sons and daughters of God who have been forgiven, who are righteous, who are children of God, who are youthful, and who have an identity of being healed. When God speaks to us and says, let's work on this, we get to say yes. We get to say yes. Because he doesn't need you to do it. You're not going to heal your blindness. You're not going to heal your body. You're not going to do anything. But he wants to walk a process with you. Sometimes it'll be instantaneous and you won't have anything to do with it. Sometimes you'll get to be part of the process but we have to be there to say, yes, God, whatever it is you tell me, yes. You want me to work on that? Yes. You want me to love on that person? You want me to pray for this person? You want me to cut this out? You want me to stop doing this? Because you have something better for me? I had to stop playing a video game on my phone that I really liked. I really liked it. And God told me, hey, will you quit that? I kept playing for three and a half weeks. And I kept saying, uh, if the, I was like uh, put, putting the old Gideon fleeces out there. If it's wet and dry, dry and wet, dry, wet, wet, dry. 
And, he, and every time he kept coming back the same way. And God's like, can't you just give me this? For you? Not for me. For you? Can't you do this? Can't you stop doing this? I mean, it's a video game. I'm like, I'm really good at it. Sometimes we don't want to. We don't want to do that. And you know what? I didn't even realize what I was missing. It wasn't because I'm not against it. I'm not calling anything out of here. I'm not saying that's between you and Jesus. But you know, what I'm saying is, for me, it was like, hey, he's like, I, I need to have more time to talk to you. And you keep playing a video game on your phone every time I want to talk to you. Can you put it down? Which is the same thing my wife was saying, consequentially. willing to say yes he'll give you the strength to do it he'll give you the ability to walk it out he'll give you the because he not only asked you to do something he then empowers you to do it that's how good God is he doesn't ask you to do something you can't do he asks you to do it and then empowers you to do it like that's how good he is we just have to be there to say yes let's pray real quick father thank you for tonight Lord I pray that these words just resonate that we can meditate on these through the week that our identity is is in you but also father god that we live a healed lifestyle that even if you don't do it how we think you should we still trust you we still love you if you ask us to step out on something or to cut something out or to do something help us say yes help us be brave and step out to the calling that you have for us Jesus' name, amen.